boy, oh boy. Hey there, guys. The weather's gotten cold, and so I have taken to spending a lot of time cuddled under this blanket and wearing my comfortable Slytherin hoodie. I got this at Universal Studios, and it makes me very, very happy. Um, as you can see, I am just kicking it because I have lots of free time this November because I am not doing NaNoWriMo. Um, uh, if you are at this video because you saw the title and you want me to bash it and uh, try to convince you not to do NaNoWriMo, this is not the video for you because I happen to love NaNo. Um, I just am not participating this year and this is why. Um, I started NaNoWriMo in 2008. Uh, it was my year studying abroad in Europe. I was in Spain that semester. and. Um, it was a really great experience. I wrote it in English, but um, I did go to my first write-in, um, and that is actually where uh, somebody at that write-in gave me the nickname Ganchi, which, as you see, is like my username everywhere now. Um, so it really influenced me a lot. Um, it was really terrible, uh, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just a lot of fun, and um, yeah, I, I won. And then I continued uh, when I got back to the States and I was my senior year of college. I did another um, nano with one friend who was at school. We did like a couple sort of pseudo write-ins together um, and had sort of a um, TGIO party at the end, a thank God it's over party where we made cookies or something and read excerpts from each other's books and um, just sort of had fun with that. And then um, after I graduated, moved back in with my parents for a while and did a couple nanos in San Diego. Basically, I did uh, 08, 09, uh, 2010, 11, 12, and 13. So six years in a row, um, and I won all six years in a row. Um, that was between Spain, Steubenville, Ohio, San Diego, and then Orange County. Um, and yeah, I loved it every single time. And I have never had um, any, like, ambition to do anything with my manuscripts. I don't really feel like getting published. I don't feel like any of my drafts are really worth the effort of editing and publishing. Um, I don't feel like it would be worth it for me personally to go through all that work. Like, it just doesn't sound like something that appeals to me. I'm not, um, emotionally invested in those stories very much. It was just fun. Um, I really, I really enjoy having a project to work on, and uh, 50,000 words in 30 days is a project, um, and it's something though that's like, it's manageable, that's what I like in a project, is something that is challenging but doable, um, and so I was, you know, really hustling those first few years, it was, you know, challenging, but I was able to get it done, I was able to stay more or less on target, um, or, you know, get caught up when I needed to. Um, the last couple years I did it, um, I would sort of get into the same routine of, um, sort of slacking up most of the day and then getting most of my solid writing time done between, like, 11 and midnight. I would write my, you know, 1,500, 1,600, 2,000 words um, in that hour before midnight so that I could get my um, my number count, my word count in before midnight. Because at that time, you couldn't go back and edit in your numbers from previous days. Um, you had to put your number in before midnight, otherwise it wouldn't count on the graph. And so I definitely am motivated by graphs. Um, I made my own like Google spreadsheet uh, to track all the different data and uh, sort of I, I'll modify my daily goal for each day based on the average day of words I need to write each day to finish and stuff like that with all these charts and I keep modifying that every year um, because it just it motivates me uh, to have all the data there and just having that kind of an achievable goal I really liked and I liked the camaraderie of the write-ins and just sort of a creative outlet um, but then come 2014 I just I November came around and I realized I didn't have a story um, like I probably could have come up with one if I wanted to I always had before because it was never about the story it was about the process and about the community and about Nano itself 
Um, I could have come up with the story, but for the first time since I had started doing it, it just, I didn't feel like I wanted to. Um, I kind of felt like I needed a year off. And so I did. I took a year off in 2014 and 2015. Um, 2014 was, yeah, just because I, I kind of felt like I needed to take a year off. The next year I was planning a wedding um, and also, you know, wanted to, like, it was easier to skip a year after skipping the previous year because I, I had given myself that permission and that was fine. Um, and then last year, my husband said he wanted to write nano, a nano novel and I said, I'll do it if you do. And I kept asking him all through October, are you still going to do it? And he said, yeah, until like November 2nd, he was like, I didn't start yet. I'm not going to do it. We have different views of like how to set goals and how to achieve goals. And he's more abstract in his goal setting, which I guess that works for him. And so I'm not going to knock it like, but I tend to be a lot more, um, what's it, uh, concrete with my goal setting. Like I look at what's uh, easy, what's achievable, and what's just pushing it, and I pick something in that higher range that I can feel really good about, but, like, I always pick something that I can do and something quantifiable. I mean, I guess that's that's what they say you're supposed to do for, like, any goal, is to pick something that you can quantify your terms of success, and so that's what Nano has that, you know, very simply, it's in numbers, and you either you make it or you don't. Um, and, you know, something that is achievable for you and something that has a deadline. Nana knows that, too. Um, yeah, it's really just about the goal setting and the creativity. Uh, anyway, so I did do it last year in 2016, but um, I didn't actually do a 50,000 word novel. I, I was a rebel. I, uh, a nano rebel is anybody who doesn't do, doesn't follow any one part of the nano rules. So if you write an autobiography, that's not fiction, so it doesn't count, so you're a rebel. Or if you write a collection of short stories, it's not one whole story, and so you're a rebel. Or if you pick up something that you started, you know, you write 50,000 words on an existing project, then it's breaking the rules, and so you're a rebel. Well, what I did instead um, was I wanted to write an audio drama script to potentially maybe be used on the podcast that I do for myhogwarts.com. Um, it's been a year now, and I have not started to edit it, um, so we'll see if I ever decide I want to use it as a script, but, um, that was the idea, is to do a script, and so, um, if any of you are familiar with, um, you know, the Office of Letters and Light and all the things that they've done, uh, in the past, there used to be a program in April called Script Frenzy. I think it might be an official option in Camp Nano now. But I've never done Camp Nano, just because, I don't know, it just didn't work for my schedule. Um, but basically it was a 100-word script instead of a 50,000-word novel. So I decided I was going to do Script Frenzy in November last year. So I did get my 100 pages of a script. I did um, 10 10-minute, 10 you know, mini-episodes uh, of an audio drama. So that was uh, 100 pages. It's about a minute per page, so 10 pages times 10. Um, and so I got that done, but it wasn't nearly 50,000 words, and I decided that since I was rebelling in that way, where it was significantly fewer words than I would have been writing otherwise, um, I, I didn't feel right about claiming the win, so I didn't. Um, I'm just marked as a participant on my, uh, my profile there, but yeah, um, again, this year I just, I didn't have a story, um, I didn't have sort of the motivation, and I just got done with a very busy October where I had a lot of projects on my plate and um, it's it's been really nice to sort of relax before the holidays to not have a lot of that going on um, and uh, yeah to sort of enjoy the weather getting colder and cuddling a little bit um, sort of enjoying life but as a special treat for you guys um, and since I know you like my long videos I thought I would pull up some of my drafts from previous nanos. I have them all in a Google Drive folder. Um, and let's see, I'm gonna pull up, not that one, I'm gonna pull up uh, the very first year, 2008. I don't even remember what it's called. Let's see. 
Maybe it doesn't have a title. Um, this was the very first nano I did in 2008. I was a junior in college and um, I was not very good at writing. <laughs> but um, yeah, this story was basically, uh, I'm just going to scroll randomly through it and pick something in the middle. This story is about this girl who's being sort of yanked involuntarily uh, between like two parallel worlds and she's sort of predestined or something by prophecy to fall in love with the prince there but like she has a boyfriend back home and it was a mess um, and I didn't really do character development very well but anyway um, let's go ahead and read some of chapter four shall we Emma stopped dead in her tracks in shock and blinked at the sudden light that hit her eyes it took her a few seconds to realize where she was. She wasn't in her dark hallway anymore. She found herself surrounded by bright blue skies and deep green rolling hills. She was on the crest of a hill, a very familiar hill, she realized. She could see in the town of Larkariel off in the distance. This was the same hill from where she had caught her first glance of the village the day before. Or was it the day before? The concept of time seemed to have a different meaning standing there wherever there was. The realization that she had returned hit Emma with a huge emotional and mental thud. She realized all at once that this was definitely, sorry, definitively not a dream and that she could no longer go on trying to convince herself that it was. That, of course, opened up a whole other collection of questions about where and why, but for the moment she focused on the fact that it had shocked her so much the first, last time she visited this village. Uh, she found herself believing automatically everything that Galio had said to her and the thought that she had somehow been destined for this inexplicable journey so as to become the bride of the prince of a magical fantasy land. It made her question everything she had believed about the universe. This is so not what I need right now in my life was the most coherent thought that she could that could make its way through. So there you go. That gives you... <laughs> A bit of uh, an example. Let's look now, let's see, at the very last nano uh, that I did as a novel. This is 2013, and let's see which one this was. Oh gosh, this was not good. Oh, I don't know if I want to look at this one. This is about um, somebody living in Paris sort of based off my experiences there, but not really, um, uh, who makes up stories about the people she sees on the metro in her head. And I ran out of stuff to talk about here, um, like, pretty quickly. Let's scroll around, see if we can find the beginning of this section. Uh, let's see. Oh, well, that's a long paragraph. All right. I'm in the middle of a chapter somewhere, somewhere about three quarters of the way through this mess of a novel. I think this, now that I think about it, I think the way that 2013 ended up uh, might have been one of the reasons why I decided that it was time to take a year off. Because uh, I seem to have run out of ideas and I needed some time to recuperate that creative energy. <laughs> So here's, uh, I, I wish I had a names for you. Like, I'm not sure if I ever titled this one. She opened her eyes as the doors opened at the next station. This is a terrible sentence. A pair of eyes caught hers from across the train. I just used eyes three times and opened twice. Okay. And she stiffened as hard as a board. It was him. It was him. She had to get out. Now. She screamed silently inside her own head and glanced wildly around the train for a way out. But he was standing between her and the open door on the station platform. He was grinning wildly, revealing dirty yellow teeth and laughing at her. Laughing. Why wouldn't he stop laughing? She turned around again, determined to fight her way through the crowd and get out through the next door. But he was still there. The door slid shut. Pierre's laughing face took residence on the next passenger over, staring at her like she had gone insane. She started to whimper and push her way through the door and the swiftly rushing dark tunnel beyond. Another three people she pushed aside turned to her, angry voices rising in a cacophony of noise and confusion, and from their fiery eyes shone Pierre's gleeful, spiteful anger. Soon the entire train car was staring at her. 
looking on with mingled expressions of distaste, anger, confusion, and humor, each one with the face of her attacker, until she screamed out in panic and fury. There was a soft ding as the door slid open, and she practically fell out of the train onto the platform, looking around her wildly for the exit. She didn't care where she was. She didn't care as her mind cloudily registered that she was at Pierre's stop, that she might run into the real Pierre around any turn. Everyone, every person was Pierre, and what did it matter that only one of them had actually assaulted her? They were all culpable. The whole world had attacked her. It wasn't safe anymore. She pushed and shoved her way through the station and up out of the white tile tunnels until she finally gained the overcast sunlight and unobstructed air of the outside. She collapsed briefly against a metal post, gulping in great lungfuls of air and struggling to regain some sense of composure before giving it up and dashing off down the road at a tilt, making her way wherever she could, anywhere, just to get away from that metro line, to get away from him, to get away from her own mixed senses of guilt and anger and confusion and... Dot, dot, dot. She reached a square in the middle of a block, pulled herself around a light post, and collapsed chest heaving on a park bench where she sobbed inconsolably into her briefcase not even caring that a nearby mother was pulling her two children away from her as if afraid she would jump up and attack it didn't matter it didn't matter what anyone thought about her anymore she couldn't even look herself in the eye anymore what was her problem did it matter and even if it mattered did it matter that it mattered that that is a marvin the paranoid android quote from the hitchhiker's guide radio drama uh, she shut her eyes and rested her weary head on the bench, welcoming the cool breeze of the morning air on her trembling and tear-stained face. Yeah, a lot of those seem like word padded. Um, all right, so that's that's all I'm going to subject you to in this video. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you watched all of that, I'm very sorry. Uh, but I do appreciate you tuning in and joining me on my channel. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more of these videos. Uh, I probably will not be subjecting you to my reading, but I'll get back to planner stuff pretty soon. Um, yeah, the like button's down there too. And if you want to make my day, you can comment because I can't stop smiling when people comment. All right, love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thank you.